Math 1314 Tyler Junior College, section 1.5 quadratic equations, video 5 of 10. The previous video concluded with a cliffhanger. Imagine that. The equation we were trying to solve was x squared plus 6x plus 1 is equal to 0, but we ran into a couple of problems. Number one, we can't solve it by factoring. It won't factor. Don't believe me? Try it. But I promise you, you'll fail because it's prime, uh, uh, the adjective for something that won't factor into smaller factors. And there were too many terms to try to solve using square roots. Because if we did the procedure, which was here, we would isolate the x squared by moving everything to the right and hit both sides with the square root. But then this x term would be trapped and we'd be stuck. So what do we do? Well, the short answer is, we're going to use square roots anyway. But, but you just said that you can't solve it using square roots because it has too many x terms. One of them gets trapped in the other side. I know. But we, that just means that we can't use square roots yet. Uh, what can I possibly mean by yet? Well, if you'll if you recall, there were some problems in the previous video that looked something like this. x plus 3 squared is equal to 16. In fact, that was one that we solved. The left side is something that was already factored into x plus 3 times x plus 3. It was just written with 1x plus 3 because the factors match. So can we capitalize on this? Can we somehow doctor this problem up so that the left side will factor, but not only factor, factor into the same thing twice? Because if it did, then we could write it once with the square, and we would be ready to use square roots. And you'll notice I didn't give you the title. That was on purpose. We'll fill it in when the time is right. Or you can look down in the video description. But wait, if you're watching this in Canvas, and the YouTube video is embedded in the module, I don't think... Actually, it'll show the title if you hover the pointer over it. So anyway... Let's pretend that you can't see the title, or you're not seeing it. Let's figure out how to solve this by tricking the problem out so that the left side will factor, but into the same factor twice. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, we can do that if this number were the correct number, the 1. It is not the correct number. So let's relocate it for a minute. This will transform into a how-to list. Let's move the 1 over by subtracting it from both sides, and we get x squared plus 6x equals negative 1. And if you'll notice, I left a gap where the 1 used to be, because my initial goal is to try to find the perfect number to put here that will not only make this factor, but factor into the same thing twice. Now, some of you may know where I'm going with this, but humor me for a moment. I know what I want to happen. I want this to factor into... The same thing twice. Now, I know what that same thing has to be. Just think about what number would have to be here and here. Let's go ahead and put pluses there, keeping in mind that it could be minuses. As a FOIL problem, the first part of FOIL is already, is already set. x times x is x squared. I'm not, I'm not worried about that. But the outside and the inside will be some unknown number times x twice. And I know what that has to give when I combine them. <coughs> Excuse me. When I combine these x terms, it's supposed to give a plus 6x. So here's what I know. These have to match. They have to be the same. And they have to add to give positive 6x. So what can I write that matches itself and adds to give 6x? Well, what's half of 6x? 3x. So I know that whatever this foil problem is, the outside and inside must give me plus 3x and plus 3x, because I need it to be 6, but I also need them to match. Okay, well that tells me that these two question marks should be 3s. So this is the factorization I'm shooting for. This is the factorization that is guaranteed to give me the x squared up front, the 6x in the middle, and at the same time have these factors match. But we're not quite out of the woods yet because this will not factor into that unless it has the correct number here. 
And what is that correct number? Well, that's like asking what's the last part of this foil problem. Well, the last part of this foil problem is 3 times 3, which is 9. So, I need a plus 9 here. So let's put a plus 9 there. Now, you can't just walk up to an equation that's perfectly balanced and say, I'm going to add 9 to the left side because I need it there. Unless, you know the rule, whatever you do on the left side, you have to do on the right side. So if I'm going to add a 9 here because I want a 9 there, then I also have to add a 9 here. Now what does that get us? Well, x squared plus 6, 6x six plus 9 will factor into x plus 3 times x plus 3. On the right side, we have negative 1 plus 9, which is 8. Now, previously I said being factored is useless if you're not equal to 0. That's not always true. In this case, being factored is convenient, although it's not equal to zero, because the factorization on the left is a perfect square. One factor times itself. So I can rewrite x plus three as, I'm sorry, I can rewrite x plus three times x plus three as x plus three squared is equal to eight, and suddenly I've gone from too many x terms to just the right number. In other words, I have massaged this problem, I've manipulated, I've waved my hands, I've done smoke and mirrors, whatever metaphor you want to use. Idiom? Yeah, whatever idiom you want to use. And transform this to a problem I couldn't solve using square roots to a problem I can. Let's go ahead and finish this and then we'll, we'll uh, summarize what just happened here. If I square root both sides of this now, The square, root, the square root will cancel the square, leaving x plus 3. I'll use a plus minus on the right side. Oh, look, a square root I have to simplify. Think about it. How can you split an 8? You don't have any options. 4 times 2 is good. The square root of 4 is 2. The square root of 2 I don't know, so I'm going to leave it alone. And I get x plus 3 equals plus minus 2 square root of 2. Not finished yet because the x isn't by itself, but I can subtract the 3 over put it in front of the plus minus, and I'm done. X is negative three plus or minus two times the square root of two. There's no need to separate the plus minus because these are not like terms. This has a square root of two, this one does not. So it's actually over in terms of solving. But what the heck just happened here? What happened was we took a quadratic equation with two terms, two X terms and a third constant term, uh, the, the term without an x, the term that's just a number, it's called the constant term. We move the constant term to the other side to make room for a better constant term. That better constant term caused this trinomial to not only factor, but factor into the same thing twice, setting it up so that we could use square roots. This technique, you may already know, is called completing the square. The phrase completing the square refers to completing the trinomial with the perfect constant that causes it to factor into a square, completing the square. And here's the great thing about it. It will always work. Always. Now, most techniques that are universal, that always work, are usually drawn out, long and drawn out, and they're just annoying. That's the price for being universal, more complicated. The simpler things like factoring and using square roots are nicer and quicker, but don't always apply. So that's a life lesson for you. Things that work all the time are usually more complicated than easier things that only work some of the times, but they only work some of the times. So can we kind of summarize what just happened here? Well, we can. I'm going to go ahead and start a how-to list, how to solve by completing the square. And we're going to set up another example. But this time as we go through it, we're going to categorize the steps that we do. So let's come up with another one. Let's go with, uh, I'm not going to overcomplicate it yet. That's what the next video is for. Let's go solve x squared. Um, minus 5x 
I'm going to write something down and just, I'm sorry, not 5x, I didn't mean to say 5x. Uh, let's say minus mm, 14x. Yeah, we'll do that. And let me set this up to do what I want to do. So um, i got to think about this for a second. Oh, let's see, I'm going to air from the middle of the side, so I need to be negative 36. Negative 85. No, I'm sorry, positive 85. Is that what I want? I'm trying to make something happen here. Hold on. Normally I have these worked out in advance, but I'm coming and improvising right now. Uh, that's 85, uh, yes, yes, okay, cross my finger. You know what, it really doesn't matter, it's going to work. Will it give the answer I wanted to give? I don't know, we'll see, I think it will. By the way, this won't factor, give it a try, good luck with that, you'll fail, because it's a prime, if the answers are what I think they are. So how about we solve this? Well, the objective behind completing the square is to get rid of the constant term and replace it with a better one. So your first move is rewrite the equation. Rewrite the equation in the form x squared plus bx equals c. And if you're thinking, don't you mean negative c? Well, remember, these variables can be positive or negative, so it's not really necessary to write negative c. Basically, you need an x squared, an x term, and then the constant on the right side. <coughs> so what would we have to do here to get this, get this ready? Well, the constant term needs to move, so the 85 needs to move. And when we move it to the other side of the equation, it becomes a negative 85. Okay? But how are we going to codify what happens next? Well, let's do it here and see if we can talk about it in generic speak. I know that when I factor this, these have to match. But I also know because of the outside and the inside terms combining, that they have to combine to give negative 14x. So what number can you combine with itself to get negative 14? Well, what's half of negative 14? negative 7. But if these two constant terms in the factors are negative 7, what is their product as the last part of FOIL? Negative 7 times negative 7 is positive 49. So we need to add 49 to both sides. But how are we going to write that generically? Well, how do we get from the negative 14 to the 49? What do we do to the negative 14 to get negative 7? We took half of it. And what do we do with it once we took half of it? We basically squared it. Half of negative 14 is negative 7. Negative 7 squared is 49. So we took half of this, squared it, and added it to both sides. So how can we write this here? We're going to add something to both sides. 1 half times b squared. You know what? I can write that more cleanly. 1 half times b is just b over 2. Now that's a b, not a 6. To both sides. And remember, don't get hung up on the letters. What this is saying is take half of this, square it, and add it to both sides. Take half of negative 14, square it, and add it to both sides. Half of negative 14 is negative 7. Negative 7 squared is 49. And that can actually happen without writing these factors. The factors justify what's happening, but that move can happen without it. If you were to document it, it would look something like this. Half of negative 14 equals negative 7, and then square that. Negative 7 squared equals positive 49. That's how you discover the perfect number to complete the square. Half of this, and then square it, add it to both sides. Now what happens as a consequence of that move? You get to factor. Factor the left into a perfect square. And it should happen by design. The left side will not only factor, it will factor into something squared. Now, this is the great thing about it. You don't have to guess what it is. That something 
will be x plus or minus a number. What number goes here? Whatever you got when you first took half of this. In other words, it's what I call the transition number. It's the number in transition between negative 14 and positive 49, the negative 7. So you don't have to guess what goes there. Just say, what was half of this? Oh, negative 7. Now, of course, you got to combine these guys. And if I did it correctly, and I believe I did, you get negative 36. But if you can factor the left into a perfect square, you are now ready to solve using square roots. And that is the fourth and final step. Solve using square roots. In fact, the whole premise behind solving by completing the square is to not actually solve it at all, but to prepare it to solve using square roots. Move the constant term, it's probably not the one you want. Find the correct one by squaring half of this and adding it to both sides. That will force the left to factor into a perfect square, and then you solve using square roots. So if we were to solve this one, we would square root both sides, get the square root of x minus 7 squared equals the square root of negative 36. Here comes imaginary numbers. Square root cancels the square, leaving x minus 7. Over here we use a plus minus. That is so easy to forget. That's the biggest problem with solving using square roots, remembering the plus minus. What's the square root of negative 36? It's not 6, and it's not negative 6. It's 6. And because these are not like terms, the best I can do is move the negative 7 over. And when I do that, it becomes positive. I get x equals 7 plus or minus 6i, and it's done. So what can go wrong? <laughs> you get tired of hearing me say that. But the truth is, this is how theoretical math, this is one way theoretical math is discovered, slash invented, slash created, whatever verb you want to use by taking something that works conveniently and trying to break it and seeing how to overcome it. So in the next video, we're still going to solve by completing the square, but I'm going to show you a couple of things that could go a little bit off. Oh, that was a long video. Sorry about that.